Welcome to Tune In Tuesday, the Fort Witnesses of the Messiah, Chapter 2, Session 3A, Jesus Christ the Righteous One, and the, name, and the title of this session is, The Kingdom is at Hand. Now that we have framed the baptism in its proper light as a dispensational milestone, we can truly understand its momentous nature. It truly was a starting line, and now the race of the ages was off to a start. But this was much more than a race. It was a battle for who gets to claim eternity. Who would win, good or evil? Many things were now set in motion, and there's a galaxy of truths that must be explained to set this event in its proper perspective. My goodness, where do I start? We were in Matthew chapter 3, so please turn there to Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. We'll pick up where we left off. Matthew 3, 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Ren Minetti has helped set this moment in history, chronologically, and we have poised it spiritually in the roll-up to chapter 1 of this class. Now, I must deal with another mine in the theological minefield. The kingdom of heaven. Uh, whoa, Nelly. There's a lot of contention regarding this term, what it means, when it starts, who it affects, etc. There are many scholars and organizations invested in whatever positions they've adopted, and they will defend them passionately. But let me begin with this. I don't blame anyone if they are incorrect about this topic. I do not doubt their personal integrity for anyone so concerned about the kingdom of heaven must be good at heart. I do not esteem them as an enemy for we truly are Christian brothers. But I also understand the momentum of the pressures that have been built up for all those positions over the years and the famous names that have spoken, and all that has been said. Um, maybe I might be the right person to deal with all that, because I had been bullied most of my formative years, so I know how to deal with intimidation. <laughs> maybe it is by God's grace that I have chanced upon my methodology, which has worked so many times in the past, to untangle the Georgian knot of doctrinal contentions in other topics. And tonight I stand before you, having done so with the seven ones of original Christianity and with the Old Testament history class. So I, I have a proven record of success, and I believe that the same approach that I used in the past will work now. I think that if we choose the right perspective, and use biblical concurrence where the majority rules, not one's favorite verse, we will understand this term, the kingdom of heaven. I think that the perspective to start with is, what did the kingdom of heaven mean to that audience when John the Baptist spoke it? And what did he mean when he said it was, quote, at hand, unquote? I can tell you right now, it was electric. What did they think when they heard that term, kingdom? Of course, they associated it with prophecy. Otherwise, John the Baptist would have been just another reformer, just another voice in the wilderness, crying out because of the crooked and sinful ways of his time. But what singled out John as unique in his time was 
his God-given mission and method and message. His proclaimed mission was to prepare the way of the Lord. The Messiah was coming. Really? Wow! That sparked many hearts groaning under the oppression and spiritual abuse of the Pharisees and Sadducees. His method was enhanced because John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb. Consequently, he could cut through all the psychological smoke screens and people's rationalizations regarding truth and confront their thoughts even before they spoke them. Ooh, the sheer power of that took their breath away. He said, This is the straight path that the prophets have laid out. This is the way of the Lord. Make your way straight too. His method involved encouraging them to confess their sins and to turn a new leaf in their lives and come back to the truth and commemorate such by the rite of baptism in water. And his message was that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Wow, what did that mean to them? Both oral and written traditions of the Jews had a lot to say about that. The original oral tradition of the Jews, the celestial gospel, and what God told Adam and Eve, that was later written in Genesis 3.15, foretold of a coming Messiah who would regain dominion of the world. That dominion ultimately would involve a formal political kingdom. Later, this information was supplemented by the voices of the prophets, including promises to David and even a covenant made with David concerning it. The details of the promised kingdom were etched in scripture as more and more got written. But we must remember that the prophets spoke far more than what got written. That oral tradition, maintained by memory by the schools of the prophets, was lost when the sages supplanted the prophets after Ezra and their oral traditions of the Mishnah and Gemara replaced. Yes, I just said replaced them. So a lot was lost, and all we have now is what got written. Well, watch out. Be careful. Uh, well, now we, we just skirted the mind in the theological minefield. So, to avoid any accusations that I'm teaching you with my own words, we're going to have to hear them straight from the prophets. And here is the promise to David out of the prophet Nathan's own mouth. Look at Second Samuel. Second Samuel. When they said the kingdom is at hand, this is what they were thinking about. Second Samuel chapter 7 verse 8. Now therefore so shalt thou say to my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, and from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and I have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee what he will make thee and house. And when thy days be fulfilled, David, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, and which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever, and I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he, and this, see, this is this he is is the personification of David's seed. If he, 
commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before me, and thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words, and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. That is the kingdom. God even reinforced this promise by making a covenant with David. Look at Psalm 89. Psalm 89, verse 1. Psalm 89, 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant, my seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. David learned more about this from God and prophesied of it in the Psalms. Look at Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. It's about the kingdom. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine the vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let's break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Ah, he that sits in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, yo, you kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. That was about the coming kingdom. Then in the Old Testament history class, we followed the development of this topic when we reordered the prophets in chronological order instead of canonical order. And then we clearly saw how Jonah foresaw the doom of Israel, but shirked his responsibility to prophesy against Nineveh for fear that they might obey and not be destroyed. Well, God made sure the message was delivered on schedule, even after Jonah had been dead for three days and three nights. God had to pull a rabbit out of the hat to get that job done. Or or better said, pull a, a prophet out of a fish. Ah, why? He had an appointment to keep. God had to stay on the schedule. And they did repent. Remember, Rene Fretz pointed out the possibility that God also sent a coinciding sign of a solar eclipse. It went right over Nineveh that decade. Well, I think it coincided with Jonah's prophecy. Wow. Do you remember the account afterward that Jonah watched the city after he made his pronouncement and God gave him a gourd (laughs) to shade him from the sun? Well, how coincidental the shade from the sun 
with a solar eclipse. Could God have explained what happened in astrophysical terms to Jonah and he would have understood? No. What was that round thing that blocked the sun? Huh. God said, it's just a gourd I grew to protect my wayward prophet from the sun. Huh. <laughs> I think that's proof of the eclipse. And so now we know exactly when the book of Jonah was, because we have a fixed point on our chronology. <laughs> Hallelujah, socket to you. I, th I think it was an allegory. Very interesting. But the people from Nineveh were scared out of their wits. Was it any wonder that the city responded? Wow. And then after that, because we reordered the prophets in chronological order, we saw that the next prophet after Jonah was that prophet that didn't deserve to be named because remember he shut up? He Remember he, he clammed up for fear of King Amaziah and he stopped prophesying? And after that he just spoke his mind? Well, bam, that disqualified that prophet. The Bible does not name disqualified prophets. After that it was up to the next prophet. Amos, who was the lowest of the low, with no pedigree, not of the schools of the prophets, a former pig farmer. And he stood up and became enshrined as the prophet that would have shut up. He spoke the answer to that burning question of the day, that if God promised the kingdom to David's seed, how could it come to pass if the Assyrians were going to wipe them out. Well, we saw the fascinating progression in the development of Jewish eschatology and Messianic prophecy that grew from Amos' seed through prophet after prophet in chronological order until it fully blossomed with Isaiah, who spoke so much messianic prophecy that the book of Isaiah is said to be the fifth gospel. Wow! Who else has seen that? Look at Isaiah 9-6 for some of these prophecies of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 For unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Marvel of a Counselor, the Mighty Hero, a.k.a. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When? In the kingdom to come. What else is he called? The Father of Futurity, as Rotherham translates, a.k.a. the Author of Eternal Salvation. And then also the Prince of Peace. Woohoo! The New Testament fulfillments clarify the proper translations of Isaiah 9 6. But what governmental responsibility will he shoulder? And when? The Millennial Kingdom. Verse 7 of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Like, ooh, can't stop this. Ooh, can't stop this. Isaiah prophesied a lot. So I'll just note the high points. And, and I'm reading to you the word of the Lord. Can anyone object to that? Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Isaiah 11, 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the reverence of the Lord, 
and shall make him of quick understanding in the reverence of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked, and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Well, who dat? The Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 6, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed, and their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den, and they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day shall it be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, and to it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt, from Pathras, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the disperse of Judah from the four corners of the earth. This is what they were expecting when they heard the phrase, Kingdom of Heaven. It was electric. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 Isaiah 61 verse 1 the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek he hath set me to bind up the broken hearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them the beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. When's that going to happen? At the resurrections. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified, and they shall build the old wastes, and they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. And you shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall you boast yourselves. That's what they thought when they heard the kingdom was at hand. Look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel 37 verse 16. Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the land of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and I will put them with him, even with the stick 
stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and I will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Verse 23, Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And David my servant shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments to observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Well, who will do that? Will it be a work of men? Daniel said how it would happen when he received the revelation about Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the four kingdoms. Look at Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Ren Minetti taught us about this. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. And in the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Verse 45. For as much as thou sawest that the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, it's not the work of men, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, and the silver, and the gold, and the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. God is going to do that. Will men do that? No. It's said without hands. So I am not the kind of dispensationalist who's trying to be the finger of God to nudge stuff into being. How will it come to pass? Daniel prophesied how. Look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. He said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So, when that will happen, the Lord Jesus Christ comes again like is promised Revelation 19, Daniel 7 went on to say that the saints of the Most High, in verse 18, will take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. See? Not before the Messiah comes, but after. Daniel even gives us more specifics. Daniel chapter 7, verse 19 about the fourth beast 
Redmond, and you taught us about this too in Old Testament history. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the rest, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured broken pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth, and spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of his kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and dividing a time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume it and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Well, the people of that day thought that the fourth kingdom was Rome. And so when they heard that the kingdom was at hand, they couldn't contain themselves with excitement. They so wanted to be free from the Romans. Well, who is this Messiah? The last words of the last prophet of the Old Testament were now burning in their minds. Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4 verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that reverence my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, you know, frolicking in the field when they're set loose. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments? Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. This is what was in the minds of the crowds gathered by the Jordan River when they heard that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And they saw the Elijah-like miracles and heard once again the words of a genuine prophet like had not been heard for over three centuries there they stood at the edge of the wilderness, gasping to themselves, pinching themselves. Was this really at hand? They were standing there with their mouths open, staring at a man named John, who was taking a stand against the error of his times and speaking the word to them. What were they thinking? What were they expecting? Well, could they have been anticipating anything else than what I just shared with you? But now, I have to ask you a critical question. Did it come? Did it? Come on, say it. <laughs> I 
I'm not just speaking to all that are here congregated tonight. I'm speaking to the future. I'm asking all those who are hearing my voice on playback. We have seen the prophecies. Did they happen? Did they? Say it. You got to say it out loud. Did it happen? I just read to you the word of the Lord, folks. I don't know how to pose this stuff any bigger. These were not my words, but the words of the prophets. Now, I'm sorry to have to be so insistent, but we're dealing with errors in a minefield. And those two things don't go together well, as you can imagine. One needs a reliable map in a minefield. The map through the minefield is laid out by the prophets in the Word. Will you follow it? (laughs) Sorry, I had to ask. John the Baptist and later even Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. But it, it had not yet arrived. I mean, what is at hand mean? It's almost here. Almost. Jesus even said the same thing later when John was imprisoned. Look at Matthew 4, verse 17. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven was at hand still then. It had not yet come into existence, but was still imminent. The Greek word standing behind the is at hand is engizo, to draw near. It was still around the corner in the future. However, since we believe Matthew was a Hebrew original, some scholars postulate that this Greek word that was translated engizo came from the Hebrew word karav, Q-A-R-A-V which Brown Driver and Briggs Lexicon says means to come near, approach. But that's speculation because we don't have the original Hebrew text. What we do have is a Hebrew text from the 14th century. That's the earliest Hebrew text of Matthew in existence now, which George Howard in his book, The Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, says that it uses Karov, in Matthew 4.17. But it uses a different word in Matthew 10.7, which also puts the kingdom of heaven in the future. There is a possibility that that Hebrew word could have been nagash, N-A-G-A-S-H. But even if it was karav in Matthew 4.17, there are some scholars, including David Biven and Roy Blizzard, in their book, Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus, that make a jump in logic and say that this does not imply that the kingdom of heaven is future, but that Jesus was saying that it actually had arrived. That's what they said. This is the kind of stuff I got to put up with. People are trying every trick in the book to legitimize their theology. I disagree with what Biven and Blizzard said in four ways. First, it doesn't agree with prophecy. It violates biblical concurrence. We just read all those verses, and there's a bunch more. And so, it disagrees with all that. Second, if John and Jesus meant it had arrived, well, they certainly would have been making moves that were more military or political in nature than they did. Third, it's a lexical violation because Bivid and Blizzard's idea ignores clear Old Testament verses that use karav that announce an impending time period. Here's an example. Zephaniah, Zephaniah 1.14. Zephaniah 1.14. The great day of the Lord is near, karav and hastes greatly even the voice of the day of the Lord and the mighty men shall cry there bitterly it's impending corrupt but finally Bivin and Blizzard in Deuteronomy 22 13 and 14 
Genesis 20, verse 4, and Isaiah 8, 3, cite a euphemism to support their idea that Karav had actually arrived. And this Karav euphemism is to come near as in to have sexual intercourse. <laughs> Whoa, Nelly! While even though that kind of quote-unquote arrival is much more than being near, it still is a logical violation because the fact that it is a euphemism strengthens the opposite meaning in non-sexual contexts. Well, how so? Well, the existence of a euphemism automatically acknowledges the presence of a separate literal meaning for a word, and a euphemism only occupies a niche in the range of meanings and is only appropriate in specific wink-wink type of contexts. But there's no sexual innuendo regarding the kingdom of heaven, is there? (laughs) <laughs> That's absurd. So, this is another example of the strategy of the opposition. They find a possibility that fits their belief, and then they defend it even if it violates stuff. So, if the Hebrew original for Matthew ten seven and 4 was that the kingdom of heaven is Karavnir, it would have been understood as being in the future. It had not yet arrived. Now, and I'm sorry to have to confront with facts, but it's very important to realize that this condition, that it still had not come, was also true still at the end of Jesus' time on earth. For this subject even came up at his ascension, proving that heaven's kingdom still had not yet come. Look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Verse 6, just before the ascension, it says, When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They're asking about it. It hadn't come. And he said, And it's not for you to know the times and seasons which fathers has put in his own power. So, the meaning of the phrase, kingdom of heaven that John was talking about, Matthew 3, is indeed governed by the Old Testament prophecies regarding it. Although Jesus announced it was coming throughout his ministry, heaven's kingdom did not actually arrive. The prophesied kingdom on earth had not yet been manifested. It could have, you know, it could have had the Jews wholly accepted Jesus as the Messiah, it could have. But few of the Sanhedrin did so, and few of the priests did. You know, many of the priests may have been convinced, but they were afraid to openly say so. So I say, just as the children of Israel were turned away from the promised land because of the majority of the twelve spies had an evil report, they were turned away again from the promised kingdom because of the same kind of unbelief. It's interesting. You know, they had 40 years in the wilderness, and right after that they had 40 days that Jesus is upon earth. That's very interesting. But the Old Testament prophecy obviously did not come to pass yet. They had two parts, suffering and glory, right? By the end of the gospel era, some of the things had happened, the suffering parts. But the second part, the Messiah and his glory, and the kingdom and all that, it had not happened. That will occur in the sixth administration. It is recorded in the book of Revelation, chapters 19 and 20, and in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 28. This includes the Battle of Armageddon, with the armies assembled in Revelation 16, the devil being bound, the resurrection of the just, the reign of Christ, and the Jews functioning as priests. Let's look at that. Revelation 19, 
Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was close with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, that he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the white press of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that brought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Woohoo! And the remnant that were slain with the sword of them that sat upon horse, which the sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Wow. That's the great war that was foretold, after which Isaiah in chapter 2 predicted, they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. This is the battle in which the king shall stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand, as predicted in Daniel. And then, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is called the devil and Satan, and bound him a a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loose for a little season. And I saw thrones, And they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's the fulfillment of, quote, He shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the disperse of Judah from the four corners of the earth, as we read in Isaiah. And also in Isaiah 11, You shall be named priests of the Lord, men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall you boast yourselves. It's the time that the Messiah will reign and be their David, shepherd and prince. As Ezekiel 37 said, This is all yet unfulfilled when Jesus ascended into heaven. And the apostles were gaping skyward and still asking about the kingdom. So then, I bet that some people think that Jesus was called king 
throughout the Gospels. Well, guess what? Not so. I track the seven titles of the Messiah from the Pentateuch through the book Revelation in the One Lord of Original Christianity class. It also cataloged over a hundred names of the Messiah under each of the seven heads. One thing that was very noticeable was that their functions with these names were dispensationally affected, or they were affected by the phases of Christ's ministry. For example, the title Star only comes into effect after his resurrection. Or, even though he was called Lord and Christ during his ministry, that was not official until the day of Pentecost. When Peter proclaimed it. Right now in the Grace Administration, he's the head of the body, the rock, the cornerstone. But when is the era in which the title King will come to the fore? It didn't happen in the Gospel era. Yeah, the, the wise men asked, where is he who is born king of the Jews? Nathaniel called him king. But when the people tried to make him king right after the miracle of the loaves and the fish, what did he do? He hid. He didn't welcome it. He escaped into the mountain. Then, when he was in custody and crucified, he was mockingly called king, but does that count? There's only one other place in the Gospels where Jesus was called King. And that was by the crowds and in the prophecy concerning that during his entry into Jerusalem. Well, in the Old Testament, we saw a number of people at various times who were called King by a crowd in Jerusalem. They were trying to gain enough momentum to make it so. Remember, one of them was Adonijah, who tried that when Solomon was supposed to take over after David. Well, did did Adonijah make it? Did that groundswell prevail? No. Well, let me ask a question. How can one have a king without a kingdom? Had the kingdom come? No. No. It had not arrived. None of those those prophecies didn't happen. It was potential. It was still at hand. The criteria for making it happen did not occur. It was possible, but it didn't occur. So God had to go with plan B. I know Pilate asked Jesus about his kingdom, and Jesus replied that it was not of this world. But had he even won back the dominion yet? No, not yet. So then, what about after he raised from the dead? Was he called king in that phase in the Gospels? No, I looked it up. So what about now? Now, this is very puzzling. Because the way that some people talk about Jesus being their king, it must be all over the New Testament. But was he called a king in Acts? Or the Epistles? No. Not once. Well, let's ask the apostles. Did Paul ever call him a king? No. Did Peter ever call him a king? No. Did James ever call him a king? No. All three of them taught his kingdom was still in the future. Look at 2 Timothy 4.1. Paul says, I charge thee therefore before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall, future, judge the quick and the dead at his appearing at his kingdom. It's still future. James, James chapter 2, verse 5. James 2, 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that loved him? Had it come yet? No. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 11. Peter, first saw an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
shall be his future. The only apostle that calls Jesus a king is John. And that's in the book of Revelation. The closest other place I can get is 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. Then comes the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Has that happened yet? No. The last enemy shall that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it's manifest that he, God, is an exception, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, Christ, then shall the Son himself also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. But when does he get the kingdom? And when shall we reign with him, as Romans says? All that comes after the resurrection of the just, when Jesus comes with his heavenly army and takes it from the Antichrist. So, the closest he is right now is Crown Prince. He is a co-ruler. But his kingdom did not come in the gospel era, and since then it is held in abeyance till the book of Revelation. That's the truth, folks. Now, there's more to the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God that Jesus taught about, but we've run out of time tonight, and we're going to have to take up that subject again in chapter 3 of this class. Now, in the next session tonight, I'm going to take up the other terms from Matthew chapter 3 that we skipped over. So, we will do that after the break. Bless you.